Welcome friends. My name is Sandra Berry. I'm the director of Woodbrook and I'm delighted to welcome you to the 2022 Swarthmore Lecture. I know that there are many of you who are watching across the world and thank you if you've stayed up late or got up early. There are also lots of you watching from home, some of you from your meetings, some of you on your own, some of you with friends or with family. And welcome to all of you physically present here in the, in the Friends House today. There may be some of you who are watching this lecture tomorrow. <laughs> Maybe next month. Maybe even a hundred years from now, who knows? And that's the joy of Woodbrook being able to support the Swarthmore Lecture since it began. Woodbrook trustees, through a Swarthmore Lecture Committee, provide not just the financial support, but the spiritual support for the lecture and the lecturer. And we're grateful to Yearly Meeting Agenda Committee and Britain Yearly Meeting in providing the space in this room for the lecture to happen at this time. Thank you all. There will be a publication. I know some of you are very keen to get a publication, but it will be after the lecture. It will be after the follow-up sessions, and it will be after uh, the, the, the um, I think the follow-up sessions are in around June or, or July this year. But there will be one available, so never fear. You just need to wait. The lecturer this evening is Helen Minnis, a Quaker, a medical scientist. And although it's called a lecture, it's prepared ministry. As in any ministry, we don't have questions and answers at the end, and neither do we have applause. So I'd be grateful if you would hold the silence with us at the end of the lecture and Helen and I will indicate we are finished with a shake of hands. So friends, let's settle into the stillness and I'll ask Helen when she's ready to speak on the topic of perceiving the temperature of the water. Thank you. Dear friends, it is a tremendous honour to stand here before you and I hope you can feel that my words come to you with love. I want to talk to you about something that we're all part of and which I believe we can begin to change together. Centuries of overestimating one group of people at the expense of everyone else and to the detriment of all of us. We have a unique opportunity right now in 2022 to change this forever so that the next 500 years gradually gets better and better for ourselves and for our planet. I'll be honest, my response to being asked to do the Swarthmore Lecture was mixed. An initial rush of excitement, followed by a flush of annoyance that, despite having written more than a hundred scientific papers on child and adolescent psychiatry, what was I being asked to talk about? Racism. My daughter Ellie said, what, they discerned that you were the right person? Was it a bit like this? <laughs> There's a black person. <laughs> To be fair, along with other elders in Glasgow, I had been involved in some fascinating work on this topic over previous years. So once I got over my initial annoyance, I realised, and I hope you agree, that I do have something useful to say on this topic. 
But this is not a lecture about black people. And I hope that in future years, similar lectures will be given by many of us, regardless of race. I want to pause here for a moment and say how much I loathe the terminology we use to describe race. All of the words are problematic because race itself was originally a racist invention used as a way to legitimise the dehumanisation and enslavement of Africans who were forcibly brought to the so-called new world. By elevating so-called white people and subjugating so-called black people, skin colour became a crude way to decide who in these new colonies had human rights and who did not. The writer Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie speaks of how she didn't feel black growing up in Nigeria, where everyone was from a wide range of places and ethnicities. She only thought about being black when she came to the United States. Similarly, Irish immigrants to the United States after the Great Famine spoke of not feeling white until they made the same journey. So I apologize for having to use the words black, brown and white which have fundamentally racist connotations. We are all so much more than a two-dimensional categorization that doesn't even start to describe us. I prefer Pulitzer Prize winning writer Isabel Wilkinson's terminology of caste. She describes caste as an artificial hierarchy that helps to determine standing and respect, assumptions of beauty and competence, who gets the benefit of the doubt, and who gets access to resources. She says, caste focuses in on the infrastructure of our divisions and the rankings, whereas race is the metric that's used to determine one's place in that. So I'll talk in terms of caste when I can, but I also feel compelled to use the words black, brown and white, because these are the terms that stupid as they are, underpin the structures of our society and describe some real differences in our experiences. As a Quaker, I'm drawn to thinking about this in terms of our advices, queries and testimonies. I am not a race scholar and I have no desire to be, but I can draw my, on my experience as a black scientist. So let's start there. Science is all about asking questions and trying to answer them. But where do these questions come from? Why do certain questions occur to certain people? Advices and Queries 27 recommends that we live adventurously. And I suspect that some of the greatest scientific ideas came to people who've been forced to do just that, who have in fact been forced into an underdog position. Who is the only person ever to win two Nobel Prizes in different sciences? Marie Curie. Marie Curie grew up in Poland and finished high school after being consistently top of her class. But in the 1880s, universities wouldn't admit women. So she studied in the clandestine Polish Flying University meeting illegally in private houses, with classes moving regularly to prevent detection by Russian authorities. Yet despite her two Nobel Prizes, she was never honoured in the way other French scientists were honoured by being admitted to the Academy of Medical Sciences. She was still an underdog. A less well-known multiple innovator was Patricia Bath. Patricia Bath was African-American, and like Marie Curie, she was consistently top of her class. She was a stellar high school student, winning a US National Science Foundation Award, and while still at school, discovering an equation that was used to predict cancer cell growth. Despite being a proud member of the first surgical team to perform laser eye surgery at the Harlem Hospital, she was unable to get funding to pursue her research and eventually funded herself to, to visit ophthalmological institutes in Europe. In 1986, she became the first African-American woman to receive a patent, 
for the device that she invented to conduct laser eye surgery, a device still used to restore sight internationally. More than 30 million people have had this treatment across the world. For Marie Curie and Patricia Bath, the constant challenges thrown in their paths made them fearless and iconoclastic. Or perhaps their fearlessness allowed them to overcome the many hurdles that were thrown in, their, in their, their paths and that would have made other people give up. But whether cause or effect, that fearlessness freed them to be great examples of our Quaker testimony of truth and integrity. Patricia Bath said, believe in the power of truth. Do not allow your mind to be imprisoned by majority thinking. Remember that the limits of science are not the limits of imagination. A scientist friend of mine, Phil Wilson, said, science is by definition subversive. And when you think about it, that is a statement of obvious truth. What science does is look underneath the table of the status quo to see what truths might be hiding underneath it. So perhaps fearlessness and iconoclasm are essential features of a good scientist. I want to talk to you in a little bit more detail about why I think it's easier to develop these helpful attributes as an underdog scientist. At the age of 16, my son Sam developed an interest in philosophy and once spent an entire afternoon describing the Hegelian master-slave dialectic. The wording's unfortunate, so Sam and I affectionately call it the HMSD. For those of you who, like me, are not philosophers, the HMSD, well, my simplistic understanding of it is this one can get into an intellectual fight to the death with someone who, in which you're both grappling to get the upper hand. Whoever fails to get the upper hand has to run around producing more and more things or evidence to please the person who did get the upper hand. And in the process of doing so, the underdog realises his, his or her own creativity or competence. As Sam was explaining this, I realised that this had happened to me a couple of weeks previously. I had flown with some colleagues down to London for a research meeting with a scientist colleague, a lovely collaborative man about 15 years younger than me. He and I got into a bit of a scientific debate about something I was pretty confident I was right about. Suddenly I noticed, to my amusement, Everyone was hanging on my younger colleague's words and giving him the floor. After the meeting, I asked the advice of a colleague who said, I'm pretty sure you're right, Helen, but check with so-and-so. So I checked with so-and-so and, and they said, I'm pretty sure you're right, but check with so-and-so. And after I'd gone through this process a few times, I got the confidence to email one of the UK's top statisticians. By that time, I had honed my question into a nice, succinct paragraph of text. Her response was three words. You are correct. But in the process of running around to please the person that got the upper hand in the HMSD, I had become much surer of my ground. Another skill that one has to learn as an underdog scientist is double consciousness. W.E.B. Du Bois was an American philosopher and social scientist who in 1903 described how people living on the wrong side of oppressive societies are forced to look at themselves through the eyes of others, to reconcile two opposing views of themselves. A personal example of this was when, shortly after being promoted to professor, I was invited to a celebratory lunch. One of my colleagues took a double take when he saw me. He said, Helen, what are you being promoted to? It was a lunch for new professors. When I said professor, he said, gosh, Helen, I thought you were just a young girl. 
I was 51. <laughs> but as a black woman working in overwhelmingly white spaces, I've had to adapt to the fact that the way I see myself is often at odds with the way that others see me. Double consciousness and other manifestations of daily racism are bad for our health. The Harvard professor David Williams has shown how the stressful adjustments that black and brown people must make on a daily basis can cause health problems such as heart attacks. Daily discrimination causes premature death. But the kind of science that I do, randomised controlled trials of complex thera therapeutic interventions, rests on making sure that everyone involved understands why we're doing what we're doing and feels free to ask for things to be explained over and over again if necessary. Having to be constantly on my toes about these subtle aspects of human interaction is undoubtedly stressful and perhaps bad for my health, but I do believe it has made me a better scientist. Yet despite the advantages that underdog scientists undoubtedly bring, the science world is still led by an elite group of mainly white people from the south of England and certain parts of the United States. This is something that the major funding bodies have been really trying to address because they realise that there could be many Marie Curies or Patricia Baths out there going under the radar, perhaps never even getting a chance to try science in the first place. Some would go further and would argue that diversity itself is what is needed for science and other kinds of innovation to move forward. In his book, The Medici Effect, Franz Johansson says, the intersection of fields or cultures could be great for new ideas. Johansson is of mixed ethnicity, with a Swedish father and an African-American African Cherokee mother. He saw throughout his life countless examples of how my parents mixed and matched ideas from their various backgrounds to create new traditions or new insight. This has led me to reconsider our Quaker testimony of equality and community. I think we would all want to see equality in science and any other field because equality is inherently just. But equality can only be achieved through community if we have diversity. Because if our communities are only filled with people like us, then we're excluding others, perpetuating inequalities and missing opportunities for new insight. Science is so complex that research can usually only be conducted by groups of people with different skills. When I studied epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, my tutors had an innovative way of setting our assignments. The entire group would get this, we would be put in groups, randomly in groups of four or five, and the entire group would get the same mark. For me, this was an affront to years of competitive education, of trying and usually failing to get to the top of the class. I didn't fully grasp the significance of this until I myself was leading research projects. I always work with at least 10 other scientists or other experts, and these can be statisticians, health economists, project managers, people who themselves have experienced the, the situation or the service that we are studying. I finally understood what my epidemiology tutors were trying to teach me, that science is far too complex for just one human brain. In fact, Diverse ways of thinking are required for healthy, functioning scientific teams. I, for example, am good at keeping the pace of a study, pushing us all towards the funder's deadline and brainstorming how to get around difficult problems. But we need others in the team who are pedantic and who will refuse to move on until we have ensured the governance that protects our participants. I can find those colleagues a bit irritating to work with at times. But they almost feel, almost certainly feel the same about me. 
And we just have to get over it because together we make the perfect team. But diversity in science is hard to achieve. We tend to reward and promote people who went to the same types of schools and come from a few elite universities. I suspect the lack of progress is to do with conscious and unconscious bias. You probably already know that stereotyping is a natural human phenomenon and that we're more likely to negatively stereotype people who are different from us. But what's been new to me as I've been reading around this is that stereotyping occurs across two dimensions, warmth and competence. And what that means is that people we negatively stereotype will see as as being incompetent and will perceive them less warmly. There's plenty of scientific research showing that we're more likely to associate words like lazy or poor with black people and wealthy or successful with white people. And race is not the only barrier. We're more likely to see women as passive and men as leaders. And of course, these subtle but devastating processes will play out on funding panels and at interviews for new professors. When I discussed this lecture with young friends in Glasgow, all of them could remember an experience of being stereotyped. They had experienced this simply because of being children. Each one had had the experience of knowing they had something important to say, of having an important contribution but being ignored or even laughed at. Do you remember being a child who was talked over and not taken seriously? How did it make you feel? Let's pause for a moment and think about that. One of the Glasgow young friends, a 10 year old boy, commented that stereotyping made him feel sad, as if he didn't want to be there. I found that profound. It reminded me that many people who are stereotyped on a daily basis, women, black and brown people, disabled people, feel dispirited and, and might withdraw. And so they might never get to bring their excellent ideas to the table in the first place. So why do we have those negative stereotypes? They come from the brainwashing that we have all had from hundreds of years in which European countries and later the United States have exploited black and brown people as free or cheap labor. Five of the wealthiest 12 people in history made the money in the Gilded Age the immediate post-slavery era. It's estimated that Britain extracted 44 trillion pounds from the Indian subcontinent and nine trillion pounds from Jamaica. My husband Steve is an ex-math teacher and he loves a good calculation. And he worked out that if I were to spend a million pounds a day, it would take me 3,000 years to pay back one trillion, never mind 44. Nothing has been paid back. Economists are talking about the modern day as the new gilded age with runaway capitalism and the hyper rich. My daughter Ellie works in a massive multi-story tower in San Francisco. Every day she has to walk past tent villages in which black and brown people who've had doors closed to them live without sanitation. These skyscrapers are like the mansions built by colonists in previous centuries, surrounded by shacks, occupied by the people creating the colonists' massive wealth. The difference is that our modern excessive wealth is created by people um, that are invisible to those of us receiving the bounty. When we buy clothes on the high street, 
there's little we can do to even find out whether a child sewed on the buttons in a sweatshop. I know many Quakers, including myself, find this incredibly frustrating. We believe in our te Quaker testimony of simplicity, yet we feel caught in a complex global economic web that we feel unable to do very much about. For those on the underside of the great economic divide, it's hard to move forward. It takes generations to build any kind of capitalism after slavery, piecework or sharecropping. In the United States, modern white American families have 10 times the net worth of black families. But racial disparities in wealth are at least as stark in the United Kingdom. Global, colonialism is a global phenomenon and our worldwide media perpetuates a global caste system in which chief executives are naturally envisaged as white men, while cleaners or agricultural or mine workers are naturally envisaged as black or brown. If you were to put the words wealthy or successful into Google images, you would find that, except for Barack Obama, virtually all of the faces are white. Try the word poor and you'll find plenty of images of black and brown people. Perceptions become reality in our modern cities. I doubt that only I have had the experience of being driven in a London taxi cab by a black man with a PhD in maths from an African university that doesn't seem to give him a ticket to any other British job. As a black British woman myself, and one with many privileges, I don't care that much about the fact that I sometimes experience racism. My personal outsider status has had both negative and positive impacts for me. What I care about much more is that these forces have caught all of us in a spiral that's destroying us. You might have already seen the Quaker Peace and Social Witness video, A Brief History of Climate Change from Slavery to Now, which examines how this worldwide caste system continues to wreck our planet. These racialised wealth inequalities perpetuate negative perceptions of black and brown people, further impairing equality of opportunity and preventing us learning how to move forward. It's a vicious cycle downwards. And it's a hole that all of us will fall in unless we can do something to stop it. We cannot achieve our testimony of stewardship of the planet unless we tackle the huge inequalities that arise from racism. All of us are brainwashed by a global colonial history that determines who we overestimate and who we underestimate. I am one of a tiny handful of black female medical science professors out of over 10,000 UK professors. Imagine what a much greater, medica much greater range of scientific questions we might have asked and answered if science was colourful and diverse. We might have ended malaria decades ago we might have learned from scientists in countries that had dealt with Ebola how to address the spread of coronavirus. We might have had a genuinely global approach to agriculture and to international trade. And our planet might have been in a much healthier state as a result. What does this mean for us as Quakers and for the action we can take in the world as Quakers? What can we learn from the way inequality and lack of diversity has hampered science? Some of our Quaker processes are specifically designed to encourage equality of, of contribution. If we follow our Quaker business method and have silent reflection after each contribution, this should create a space for all to contribute. But when I discussed stereotyping with young friends in Glasgow, one 11 year old girl told me that the sexist atmosphere in her school meant that she was afraid to speak up in class in case she was shown to be wrong and humiliated for it. We need to remember that 
a history of being stereotyped might prevent some people contributing even in a well-clarked Quaker business meeting. This means that despite our best efforts, our Quaker decisions still might end up being driven by an elite group of people. If science is by definition subversive, then perhaps we can use science as a helpful analogy for our position as Quakers. As a younger woman, I was inspired by the radical acts of some Quakers. For example, Ellen Moxley, whose age at 64, took a small boat with two other women and managed to board one of the nuclear submarines in Loch Goyle and remove all the computers and equipment. They were remanded in custody for three months. But in court, they argued that they had been preventing these dreadful instruments of mass destruction from breaking international law. And the judge agreed. So I don't believe we have a problem as Quakers with a willingness to be radical. I think our problem is more that we often can't see what to be radical about. Let me use a metaphor from a speech by David Foster Wallace. An old fish is swimming through and he passes two younger fish and he says, Hi guys, hope you're enjoying the water today. And the two younger fish chorus, What is water? <laughs> Although the structures around us encourage all of us, including me, to overestimate white people and underestimate black people, if you are black or brown, there has usually at some point been a point when this became obvious. So black and brown people are usually the older fish because they are constantly forced to take stock of their place within their surroundings. So although the, cult, the, the structures around us encourage all of us to overestimate white people, our caste system means that white people are often blinded by the comfort of the water. It's hard to perceive the temperature of the water if it was set to be exactly right for you before you were even born. In his article, The Rise and Fall of Default Man, the, the sculptor Grayson Perry says that in the UK, the middle class straight white Englishman is the default. Everyone else has to be considered as relative to that. So we think about the black filmmaker, the transgender poet, the woman artist. Meanwhile, for the default man, the temperature of the water is set so perfectly that he probably doesn't even realise he is in water. My scientist colleague and friend in London is a great example. He often doesn't even get to know that someone in the room is disagreeing with him. Hardly anyone dares to interrupt or challenge him. And the lovely collaborative guy that he is, I know that he would want to be challenged because that would hone his scientific skills. What, mistake, what mistakes are we making because of our homogeneity? What obvious truths are we failing to discern? Our peace testimony is perhaps the most fundamental, yet one obvious truth that I believe we often overlook is that violence and war are rooted in injustice. We strive as Quakers to live in the life and power which takes away the occasion of all wars, yet if we fail to perceive the way that our caste system cements injustice, then our peace testimony will be worthless. I'm sure we have all at times felt justifiable rage. Pause for a moment and think about when this has happened to you. It's often when we've been disrespected when our plans have been thwarted for what we perceive to be unjustifiable reasons. Due to our caste system, if one is not in an elite group, then these experiences are a much more common experience. Take, for example, the great singer and pianist Nina Simone. She was a child prodigy at the piano. 
And she had an ambitions to be a, a concert pianist. So she applied to the Curtis Institute in Philadelphia, a global leader in classical music. But she was rejected because of her colour. She had to play in bars to supplement her income. And she was embittered by this rejection of her talents for her entire life. She became known for her outbursts of aggression. It's not easy for those of us whose ambitions are thwarted on a daily basis. In their 2016 Swarthmore lecture, Peace on Peace Building in East Africa, Cecile Miramana and Esther Mombo said, conflict is rooted in the politics of exclusion, in which people find themselves denied their freedom, their identity and resources. Daily peacefulness is much easier for those of us who lead privileged lives. When I was 13 years old and already a committed Quaker, I watched the Soweto uprisings on the television in which black and brown children of my age were out marching at the injustice of being forced to take their school classes in the language of their oppressors. They had had enough. Violence broke out. They looked like me and I found it almost unbearable to imagine what they'd been going through. I remember thinking, if I was a black South African child, I'd say, give me a gun. I thought I was no longer a Quaker, that I wasn't a peaceful enough person. I became a Quaker again when a dear Quaker friend of the family, who'd been imprisoned by the Ba'athist party in Iraq as a young woman, explained to me that in her view, the pe Quaker peace testimony is all about working for peace. And that that is harder for some people to achieve than it is for others. One of Nina Simone's songs, written with Langston Hughes in the 1960s, beautifully portrays the level of anger felt by thwarted people. I'm going to sing it for you now. Hey, Mr. Backlash, I'm Backlash, who do you think I am? Raise my taxes, freeze my wages, send my son to Vietnam. You gave me second class houses, a second class schools. Did you think that all colored people are just a second class fool, Mr. Backlash? I'm going to leave you with the blues, yes I am. Well, I try to find a job to earn a little cash. All you had to offer was your mean old white back lash. But the world is big now, a big and fighting round. And it's full of other folks like me who are a yellow, beige, and brown. And Mr. Backlash, I'm going to leave you with the blues. Yes, I am. Hey, and when Langston Hughes died, when he died, he told me many months before, he said, you gotta keep on working until they open up the door. And then one of these days when you make it and the door is open wide, make sure you tell me exactly where it's at and so they got no place to hide. I'm Mr. Backlash, I'm Mr. Backlash, hear me now, I'm warning you. Somehow, some way, yeah, I'm going to leave you with the blues. <laughs> if we want to achieve peace, we need to respect that those who turn anger into violence might have reasons for that that we can never fully understand but which are likely to be due to the real structural inequalities of our caste system. To bring peace, we need to dismantle that caste system. Let's face it, it was a racist fiction in the first place. Can we not write another story? I have no doubt that all of us here want a more just world. If we were to stand a thousand Quakers in a row and ask them, do you want the kind of runaway materialism that's causing climate change? I suspect we'd get a thousand no's. 
Our form of worship should be perfect for helping us to discern how to achieve real change of the kind that could save our planet. Matthew Barzun, a close associate of Barack Obama, describes in his book, The Power of Giving Away Power, how if we want real change, each individual needs to come to a meeting expecting their thinking to be changed. We do that in our meetings for worship and in our Quaker business meetings. And we invite the divine to be among us. Yet Matthew Barzun points out that if everyone has come from a similar background and tends to think in a similar way, then there is a danger that this is not discernment, but groupthink. We have a radical vision as Quakers, but unless we become more diverse, then our ability to discern the way forward in enacting that radical vision will die out. Our Quaker wish to believe in the fundamental goodness of each individual actually doesn't help us here. We can be as individually good as we like, but unless we actively work to dismantle a system that maintains white people in a global leadership role with a perceived right to extract wealth from countries that have already been made poor, we will, con we will continue to inadvertently act against our testimonies. We uphold the racialized caste system without even realizing we're doing it. You've heard of the glass ceiling in which women and people of colour strive to break through it. But a few years ago, a study by the Social Mobility and Child Poverty Commission coined the term the glass floor, where privileged parents fight tooth and nail to prevent their less able children from social mobi mobility downwards. To the detriment of more able and less privileged children. This is achieved in a range of ways through private schools, additional tutoring, unpaid internships for our children, or making connections for them with high impact contacts in our social networks. Efforts to redress these inequalities are so far a drop in the ocean. Take the rap artist Stormzy, who since 2018 has offered full scholarships for two black UK young people each year to attend the University of Cambridge. This was expanded to 10 in 2021, so that by now there will have been 16 such scholarships out of more than 90,000 Cambridge places over those same few years. Yet I've been dismayed to hear Quaker parents complaining about these scholarships, as if this handful of free places is taking away the chances from our children. Perhaps it doesn't occur to us that our children might simply be less able and that offering summer schools and internships to talented black and brown young people who would otherwise have no chance of achieving an Oxbridge place might be the truly meritocratic approach. Or perhaps it isn't clear to us that if we want our species and our planet to survive, we need to be looking out for all of our children. This is not a question of left or right-wing politics. I had begun to think that global capitalism was the sole culprit, but reading Marxist writers, I've been shocked to realize that they were also almost entirely focused on materialism, on the means of rate and rate of production. This undoubtedly made sense back in the, United, in the 1960s and 70s when there really weren't enough resources to go around. But that is no longer true. Surely we need a new politics that takes much more than material resources into account. To consider this, let's get back to science and to another great scientist who should be much better known, Sarah Blaffer Hardy. Primatologist Blaffer Hardy made revolutionary observations of humans and other species, demonstrating that the way we humans bring up our children is much more similar to many species of birds than to the chimpanzees and other great apes we've more commonly compared ourselves to in psychology. Let me demonstrate this. I'm going to introduce you to Lawrence. This is, Lawrence. This is my wee Lawrence. Human infants are so dependent for so long that their mother's hands are literally full. 
So other adults are necessary for the children's survival. Adults who don't have their hands full of other children. These other adults can be grands, granddads, aunties, uncles, neighbours, godparents and friends. Do you mind just... Thanks, Sandra. When these crucial supporters pitch in to help raise a child, we are acting like true humans. Yet we seem to have forgotten this in the West, where we've developed a highly individualised society, focused on gaining resources for single people or nuclear families, rather than for our human species as a whole. Blaffer Hardy's work suggests that the only reason we in the West have forgotten this is that we have such plenty that we've forgotten that it literally takes a village to raise a child. Oppressed societies are much more likely to maintain these wide networks of extended family and friends as a support network for their children. I know this to be true from my own family. My wonderful white Quaker mother, rather private Quaker mother, had to tolerate my Caribbean father's open door approach to all of his wide network of extended family and friends who really could turn up at any time. <laughs> if my mum was here, she'd be chuckling at the moment. <laughs> so perhaps in the West, the abundant resources that we have, the abundant resources that we have extracted from our fellow humans and other countries on our planet, have allowed us to forget that looking out for all of our children is necessary for the survival of our species. At the beginning of my lecture, I said that I believe we have a unique opportunity now in 2022. Our planet now has enough resources to feed everyone. And we live in a global society where none of us can really hide from what's happening to children in Brazil, Ukraine, India or Uganda. Our communities are no longer simply sharing the, Kara, the Kalahari or the Serengeti. We now share the entire planet and there are enough resources that our various communities should be able to live peacefully together. If Blaffer Hardy is correct, then to achieve this, we will need to build strong networks with our fellow humans in other communities, in other cultures, in other parts of the world. This will not be an easy task. And we'll only achieve it if truly diverse minds get together to tackle it. Among many other things, this will mean actively supporting the educational opportunities of black and brown young people so that they can truly join the conversation and take their full role in helping find solutions to the crisis that we are all in. Last year, a young man called Makib Chowdhury became a doctor. My husband Steve had met Makib when he was doing some community work in Makib's high school. Makib was living in one of Glasgow's more materially deprived housing estates and his parents were Bangladeshi immigrants who had come to the UK via Russia with no financial resources or social networks to support Makib's ambitions. Getting into a UK medical school is about as hard as a camel getting through the eye of a needle for someone with no financial resources or social networks because in addition to needing stellar exam results, there is an expectation that the applicant will have done work experience with a doctor. What do you do if your family and friends don't know any doctors? Steve facilitated McKeeb doing work experience with both me and with a local Quaker GP, and the three of us put McKeeb through his paces for his medical school application. McKeeb is an exceptionally talented young man, and I feel lucky to know that he is now a fellow medic. But reflecting on this with McKeeb recently has actually uncovered my own unconscious contribution to the education gap. I have probably offered advice to more than 15 young people over the years. Apart from Makib, all of the others were children of middle class white friends of mine. If we are to support the Makib Chowdhury's of this world, 
with our financial resources and our social networks, as we would for our own children, we have to encounter them in the first place. George Fox enjoined us to walk cheerfully over the world, answering that of God and everyone. A friend in Glasgow explained to me recently that cheerfully in the 17th century meant, some, meant something a bit more similar to confident today, or actually confident but not arrogant. So let's rephrase George Fox just a little. Let's walk confidently but not arrogantly across the world, answering that of God and everyone. But of course, if we want to answer that of God and everyone, we have to have listened very carefully in the first place. Because everyone on the planet is likely to experience God in different ways. If we want to dismantle our caste system, that's going to mean spending as much time as possible outside our comfort zones, encountering people who are very different from us in ethnicity, culture and social class, really listening, being open to learn from them. This is a more difficult task for some than for others. If you're white, then through no fault of your own, you carry physical traits that can silence others. The perception of white people held by people from oppressed societies might mean that they do not think that they have the right to show you how they experience God. They might jump to the conclusion that you won't want to listen to their, to their ideas or that you might ridicule them. This is not your fault. This is the fault of 500 years of brainwashing that we have all experienced. But it means that you are going to have to work really hard to make space for other voices and to listen very carefully. In these situations, our Quaker practices should stand us in good stead, but only if we get out of our comfort zones and keep our ears open. Virtually all of the Quakers I know, not all, but virtually all, live in comfortable areas, surrounded by other people who are very like them, at least in an ethnicity and social class. It only struck me while preparing for this lecture that I've never really wanted to live in these comfortable white middle class areas, but that's because, as a black woman, I don't feel particularly comfortable in these homogene homogeneous spaces. The places where the temperature of the water feels right for me are mixed areas with residents from a wide range of social classes and ethnicities. This is yet another thing that I didn't choose and I have no right to feel superior about it. It was chosen for me by my outsider status, but it brings spectacular benefits. One example is my Syrian friend, Safana, who I met because my husband, Steve, met her husband through some work they were both doing in our neighbourhood. As soon as I met Safana, we clicked. And in the last couple of years, she's become so fluent in English that we can talk about anything. And she's become a very dear friend who I can confide in. I would never have met Safana if I'd lived in a homogenous area, but her friendship has enhanced my life to a degree that it's hard to express. I've come to realise that I've always perceived the temperature of the British water as a bit chilly as a black woman, but that's given me the confidence, the confidence that George Fox wanted all of us to have, to swim around. Why not, if it isn't particularly comfortable to stay static? Swimming around has allowed me to encounter a much wider variety of fellow fish of all sorts of incredible colours and types. In the Bahamas, where my extended family live, you only have to put your face down into the warm, shallow water to encounter a vivid world of colour and movement. Once you get your whole body down under the water and start swimming down a bit, you might then feel some colder channels threading through, but the colours and the movements of the fish will be even more amazing. This is what you can experience if you dare to perceive the temperature of the water and swim into new areas that might be a little bit chillier for you. Each of us here will be able to think of different ways of doing this. For you, it might involve joining in activities in your community or a neighbouring one with people who are likely to come from different backgrounds. 
For you, it might involve visiting other churches to experience how others worship and inviting them to come and worship with us if they wish. While stepping out of our comfort zones, we will need to become more open to critique from others. As Advices in Queries 17 recommends, think it possible that you may be mistaken. Is silent worship always the deepest way to experience God? Could communal singing, speaking in tongues, praying and washing five times a day be just as likely to give us a deep spiritual collect connection? Similarly, I'm convinced that black and brown people are just as likely to experience deep spiritual connection in silence as white people. I do. There is a multitude of ways to experience God and no way is superior to any other. When we encounter each other in the ways that are in the things that are eternal, then incredible ideas about how to affect change together might occur to us. But it's scary to really get out of our comfort zones. We are afraid of looking foolish, of saying the wrong thing. We might offend people. We might offend people so much that they call us racist or stupid. We have to shake ourselves off and dive in again. This is what black and brown people across the world are doing on a daily basis. Taking critique, belly flopping, diving in again and getting stronger for it. Only by repeatedly diving in will we begin to experience the real temperature of the water. Marie Curie said, nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. Now is the time to understand more so that we may fear less. In practical terms then, what do we do next? Will it help for us to apologise for Quakers' past involvement in global slavery and colonialism and the current benefits we reap because of that history? I think that depends on whether that ap apology is accompanied by, a, by real action to redress both past and present unfairness. Let's use a metaphor of two sisters. Actually, my sister's here, Natalie, this is not about you. <laughs> Anyway, for years, the little sister was too young to realise that the older sister was dividing out their pocket money sweets unfairly. <laughs> Honestly, not you, Natalie. <laughs> but the, the, older sister's eyes, the older sister's eyes were bigger than her stomach. So each week she puts her extra sweets in the back of her sock drawer. Soon she has an impressive stash. But then one day the mother, their mother finds the stash and the older sister confesses. But should she apologise? Well, I would argue that her apology will be hollow unless she's willing to give the sweets back. As Quakers, our apology will be hollow unless we are willing to give up some of the advantages that we have gained from hundreds of years of inequality. Here's one way we might begin to redress these imbalances, and you are almost certainly going to be able to think of many more. Let's offer black and brown young people the same or more of the kinds of educational opportunities we offer our own children. Can we support scholarships, internships, facilitate contacts within our social networks? We could do this con um, corporately as a society and as individuals. Should we be setting up a friend's educational trust that supports young black and brown people to achieve their educational ambitions through both financial support and social networks? This would be one way to begin to redress the wealth imbalances between our communities, but you may th be able to think of many more. If we have personal wealth, can we find ways of investing that back into communities whose wealth has been historically extracted? Of course, not all Quakers have money. But even if we don't have money, we do have incredible social networks within our meetings. Can we use those social networks more powerly, powerfully by inviting members of other communities to benefit from those networks? And could this be another way of expanding our own horizons? 
and learning from others who think differently from us and who might change us in positive ways. The hard fact is that if we don't work hard to promote the progress of individuals and communities that have historically been disadvantaged, then we are increasing the equality, inequalities and perpetuating that age-old caste system. Many of you have, will have seen images like the one that's about to appear. There you go. <laughs> that explain why we need equity, not equality, when sharing resources. Those people in communities who've been extracted from for centuries will need a lot more support and resource to achieve equity. In the West, we often fear that if we start redressing global imbalances, we will have to give up too much. But I think the opposite is the case. We will enrich ourselves by creating these new connections. In Quaker Faith and Practice 2906, Helen Stephen reflected on her work in Vietnam in the 1970s, saying, I believe that this fundamental, it is this fundamental respect for that of God in everyone which is at the heart of all true development. On my return home, I was horrified by our cultural, material and spiritual arrogance. Surely arrogance drives us to rape and destroy the earth's scarce resources to fuel and protect the needs of one generation in one corner of the globe. I know many of us here just want to know what to do next. We want a call to action. But I can't give you that. It's taken us 500 years and a myriad of mistakes to get into this mess. So there, were go there are going to have to be a myriad of solutions. As a middle class, British professor, I also spend most of my time bobbing around in the warm baby pool of privilege. So the answers that we need are out there in the chillier places, probably blindingly obvious to black and brown people who are experiencing on a daily basis what it means to be on the wrong side of our caste system. If we can find ways of really listening then we have our best chance of finding out what action to take. So let us not waste time feeling shame for past wrongs, dear friends. Instead of feeling shame, let's do our very best to swim into unfamiliar waters, to feel the currents and chills in that water, to experience the vivid colours and the motion in those chillier places and to work together with people who are different from us to create a better planet for us all.